If you would, turn to Psalm 49. And I'm going to pray as you're turning there. Father, we're, we're so blessed to have spent an evening worshiping you. Lord, thank you for our worship team and the various people who play various instruments and run sound and, Lord, who sing and do all sorts of different things to enable us to be able to draw near you and worship, Lord. That is such a blessing. And I know it's a large commitment on their part, and we just want to pray, Lord, that you'd continue to pour out many blessings upon our, our worship team, our audio-video team, and Lord, just pray that they would continue to be able to pursue excellence in everything that they do. Lord, for the remainder of the evening, we're going to be challenged quite deeply from your word, and we want to pray, Lord, just in these last seconds of our prayer, that our hearts would be prepared for what we have before us tonight, Lord. We'll even see in our Bible study tonight that the men writing these songs tell the people that they need to listen up. They need to not only listen with their ears, but they need to take what they hear and let it be planted deep in their heart and become part of their life. And so, Lord, cause our hearts to be like fertile soil tonight. I pray that we would have prepared our hearts to receive the seed of the word that it could then be nourished and watered and experience the sunlight and bear a harvest of righteousness in our lives tonight, Lord. So come, Lord, and speak to us through the Psalms. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. So tonight we'll study Psalms 49 through 51, and we're going to give one title for the entire study tonight. We're going to speak tonight about the judgment and the forgiveness of God. And so you'll see how that title fits in as we go. But I just want to kind of share with you, I'm, I'm trying to grow as a Bible teacher. I'm trying to grow uh, as a teacher of God's Word. And one of the things that I love to do is I love to take a chapter of the Bible and just dig and mine it for all it's worth. Uh, but we're never going to get out of the Psalms as we do that. And, and so we're going to begin a little bit different uh, journey through the Psalms from this point on. We're going to survey the Psalms rather than taking them word for word and, and line by line. So going through Psalm 49, there's a theme in this Psalm, and, and it'll take a few minutes to get to it as we dig through the Psalm, but, but it's something that we all struggle with. We're, we're going to talk tonight in Psalm 49 about the foolishness of trusting in riches. And I know that a lot of people say, I don't got that problem. You know, there ain't no riches in my life, and so I've got nothing to worry about there. You'll see as we go through here that, that maybe it's not riches. Maybe it's the desire for riches. Maybe it's trusting in something else besides riches, but there's principles here that we're going to pull out. So notice the beginning of Psalm 49. It's to the chief musician, which means that it was supposed to be sung in Israel's corporate worship life. And then it's a psalm of the sons of Korah, and we've talked week after week. As we've come across this phrase, we know that the sons of Korah were Levites, and they oversaw and led the musical part of Israel's corporate worship services. So we would say that they're worship leaders, or maybe worship ministers, worship pastors. And tonight, they're going to share a really challenging exhortation with their audience and verse 1 tells us who their audience is. Notice, hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor, together. And so tonight, this exhortation from the sons of Korah is directed, notice, to all inhabitants of the world. And I think this is really important because oftentimes when we're studying the Bible, it's believers who are being spoken to directly. But the sons of Korah are directing their teachings towards three groups. Notice, this is to believers and non-believers. This is to those who are nobodies in the world and those who are prominent members of society. And then the third thing, this is directed to people who are living in poverty as well as to those living in luxury. So this is for everybody. And when the sons of Korah use that phrase, all inhabitants of the world, just you could cross that out and you could just put everybody. They are writing to absolutely everybody. So everybody in the room tonight, this, this is to us. This is to you and I. And notice how it begins. Verse 1, hear this. 
How many times throughout the Bible have we seen God's messengers take a break from what they're teaching and say, listen. For instance, as we went through uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we kept hearing, he who, uh, let he who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is very similar. The sons of Korah are speaking to their audience and they're saying it's not enough to just hear the words that come forth from a pulpit or hear the words of your favorite radio Bible teacher as you're driving back and forth to work. It's not enough to hear the words. What you need to then do is you need to apply those words deep in your heart and then apply them in, in your life. James said not to be hearers of the word only because what happens? We deceive ourselves. He says we have to be doers of the word. James says do what it says. And, and so I want to kind of summarize this here. Look, look at verse 3. My mouth shall speak with wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying uh, on the harp. And so the psalmist is basically saying to his audience, I'm about to speak to you words of divine truth. I am about to give to you life-changing words. However, what you must do, the psalmist says, is you must pay attention to what we are about to say. I kind of relate to these guys. Because you know what I do multiple times a week? two to three times every single week of my life, and then there's a wedding, or there's a funeral, or there's a special occasion, or, you know, I, I get to go speak somewhere like that. I speak to people. And what do I speak to them about? God's Word. And I understand how hard it is to also hear God's Word because I'm on the other side. Um, you, you can ask my wife. One of the things I always have going is teachings. I, I have... I teach you guys constantly. I don't have a pastor that's speaking into my life the way you guys do regularly. And so I've got a, a bunch of people who I believe are some of the best Bible teachers in the world, and my phone and my iPad and my computer are just loaded with teachings, and I spend a great deal of time listening. And every once in a while I hear something and I go, I don't like that. Human nature is that we are, are very hard to learn people. Pe people just don't learn well. And, and I think these sons of Korah understood human nature. They knew a few things. And, and I'm telling you, like, I'm speaking to you from my heart right now. Um, and I'm speaking to you about my heart right now. The sons of Korah understood that people listen to wise counsel and then they turn around and do the exact opposite, right? The sons of Korah knew that people listen, but oftentimes they hear what they want to hear and then they go and they do what they want to do. And this is one of my favorites. The sons of Korah knew that people oftentimes hear a message and then they focus on how it applies to someone else. Right after a church service, they walk up to you and they go, man, if my wife would have been here tonight, our marriage would be so good. <laughs> you know, I need to get this tape for my boss. Well, what did God speak to you tonight? To give this to my boss. <laughs> to give this to my wife, right? And, and so the psalmist now, he goes on and he poses this rhetorical question and it speaks to us for the rest of the psalm. He says in verse 5, Why should I fear in the days of evil? when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me. You must understand, this is a rhetorical question, so what he's really saying is two different things. First, he's saying to the inhabitants of the earth, he says, none of us ever have a single reason to fear regardless of our circumstances. That's what he's saying to the inhabitants of the world. He says, we don't have anything to fear because there's a God in heaven. I found it interesting. There's a scholar that I was reading. He estimates that the phrase fear not appears approximately 365 times in the Bible. You know what that says to me? That God is saying to us, I have your back every single day. Therefore, you've got nothing to worry about. And so then if God has our back, the second thing he's saying, the psalmist, is why are you allowing your circumstances to fill you with fear and to overwhelm you with fear? And the psalmist now says, because of who God is, we have absolutely no reason to fear. But he won't talk to us about God yet. 
He's going to first talk to us about foolish people and the very foolish things that people do and the reasons that they experience fear. And he's going to focus on one group of people tonight, and they're found in verse 6, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. He says of them, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. And so in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find rich people who were godly. So one of the things that we know is that it's not a sin to be rich. And those who are not rich are not supposed to look in a judgmental manner at people who are wealthy and who are rich. The, the problem isn't when a believer has wealth. The problem is when the wealth has the believer, when the wealth controls the person. And when that occurs, then the wealthy person begins to lose perspective and they begin to think that their wealth and their possessions are able to save them. I mean, I know a lot of people who I've spoken to at various times, and when you talk to them, they talk about money constantly. How's it going? Well, it, it's okay, but um, my savings account is down 20% because, and you're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? What in the world, you know, really, how's your walk with the Lord? Good, but I'd feel better about life if I had just a little bit more money in the bank. Mm. Well, the Lord is telling us here that that's an indication that the person is now trusting in something other than the Lord to save them or to care for them. And in verses 7 through 9, the psalmist makes a very clear point that we just read, and that is that wealth and riches cannot save a person from the penalty of their sin, nor can a person use their wealth and riches to redeem another person from the penalty of their sin. So a really on fire believer can't say, well, listen, I don't trust in my riches, but I, I'd like to kind of buy somebody else's salvation. The psalmist is saying that that's ludicrous. And it's interesting. Look at the screen, if you would, because I want to make sure that, that we don't think this is just an Old Testament problem. Well, the Old Testament saints didn't understand salvation, and so they trusted in money instead of God. Look at what Peter writes. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter brings it all into perspective. It doesn't matter if you have a bazillion dollars in the bank or you don't have two nickels to rub together. The source of every human being's salvation is the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And if you're worried about money or trusting in money, Peter says, listen, these things that you're thinking about, they're corruptible. Money is corruptible. Has anybody ever had money and lost it? I hear stories about people that go to Miracle Hill and, you know, employees at Miracle Hill who they're processing the stuff that comes through and they said, man, I stuck my hand in a pair of shorts that somebody donated and there was a wad of cash. And I'm thinking, yeah, good for you, bad for some other person. I'm just going to hide this here for a rainy day, and then wife comes along and says, you know, my husband never wears these pants anymore. I'm going to take him to Miracle Hill. You know, and the husband is driving home from work going, man, I've been waiting for weeks, you know, for this special event, and I'm taking my wife out to dinner, and I've been saving and putting money in the pants pocket, and, and she goes, by the way, I took some stuff to Miracle Hill today, and he goes, well, so much for our date, right? And no matter what we're trusting in, Peter's trying to tell us that stuff's corruptible. It's going to disappear. It doesn't matter if it's silver, if it's gold. It was only the blood of Jesus that redeemed us from our eternal problem. And so the, the point is clear. Nobody can buy their way into heaven. And, and I think, you know, we're all sitting here, and I bet there's a bunch of us thinking, Pastor Andy, I've never struggled with this. I, I've never, ever thought about my money or my riches or my possessions getting me into heaven. Turn to Mark 10 for a minute. Give you a fresh look at an, a very familiar portion of Scripture that I think illustrates this principle. We all know the story of the rich young ruler. Mark 10, verses 17 through 22. 
Sounds like everybody's there, so I'll, I'll begin. Now, as he was going out on the road, this is Jesus, one came running and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Verse 18, so Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, and then honor your father and your mother. I want you to notice something. Jesus only referred to the commandments that have to do with personal relationships with other people. In other words, when he summed up the law, he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I want you to notice that Jesus focuses on the love your neighbor as yourself part. And, and then the young man comes back and, and he says to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I am an expert, a lifelong expert at loving others as myself. And then Jesus said, notice looking at him, Jesus loved him and he said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. Verse 22, but he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. I want to ask you to take a little different look at this text as you maybe have in the past. Look at the beginning where he comes and he says to the Lord, he says, notice in the beginning, he says, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Personal Personal opinion, I just, I'm not trying to create new doctrine or anything, but I'm looking at this with new eyes based on what we're studying tonight. And is it very possible that what this guy was saying to Jesus is, what good work could I do with this money that I have? I'm very rich, I'm very wealthy. What, what could I do? Could I feed the poor? Could I build a hospital for this? Or could I, what could I do? And Jesus says, this is what you could do with your money. You could get rid of it. Just go sell everything you've got. Sell all those possessions. Then come follow me. And the young man went away sad. And, and just kind of some fresh eyes on this text. I wonder if Jesus isn't saying, the reason I didn't say to you, first of all, love God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. I only focused on the love your neighbor as yourself because you've already shown me that you don't love God. You have another God. It's called money. It's called wealth. It's called riches. So we're looking at a guy here who was trusting in what his money could do to get him into heaven. And Jesus says, take that money and get rid of it because it is keeping you out of heaven. And this is the hard part of the Bible study tonight, is that all of us have to look and say, okay, well, I'm not lucky enough to be a rich young ruler. But I wonder if any of us in this room have anything in our life that is taking the place of God and keeping us from having a thriving relationship with our Creator. And if the Lord isn't saying to us tonight, you better get rid of that thing because it is keeping you from having a relationship with God. Back to our text, if you would. Back to Psalm 49. And this, the psalmist ends this text, really, giving us uh, three insights about wealth. He, he shares three things about wealth that he wants us to know. And I'll just kind of say these. Uh, wealth makes people feel invincible, like they're going to live forever. Look at what he says here. For he, this is the one who trusts in wealth, verse 10, sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish, and they leave their wealth to others. And so the psalmist reminds the wealthy people that one day, just like the fool or the wise man or any other person, they are going to leave this earth. They are going to die. Wealth does not make you invincible. And the problem with this is that everything they've amassed is going to be left to another. I recently, when Kelly and I were on our vacation, um, I don't know why the Lord led me, but I spent my morning quiet times in the book of Ecclesiastes. I talk about depressing morning devotions, right? But Ecclesiastes, Solomon's talking about a season in his life where he was totally backslidden. He had gotten his eyes on wealth and women and all these other things. 
And one of the things that he says in the book of Ecclesiastes, he, I'm kind of summarizing, but he says, you know, it kind of really stinks that a man like me can work so hard to amass riches and possessions and everything only to leave them to a son who is a fool who is going to do something stupid with these things. And that's one of the things that the psalmist tells us here in verse 10. And then beginning in verse 11 through 13, the second thing is that wealth makes people think that their name will be remembered forever. Look at verse 11. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve of their sayings. And so he's describing a person who uses their wealth to make a name for themselves, and then they die, and their wealth goes to somebody else who makes a name for themselves but forgets the first guy. You know what really came to mind for me? And I don't know this man. I never knew this man. I sure like his products. But Steve Jobs, look at all the wealth that he had and the ideas that he had. I read somewhere that Steve Jobs had enough products that, that he had thought up in his mind that wouldn't even have gone into production for like five or seven, maybe ten years. He had such a brilliant mind and foresight into the industry more money than he could ever do anything with. And then, of course, he got cancer, and he got sick. And now I think the guy's named Tim Cook. Is that his name, the, the CEO? You know, but, but really, does the world really even think much about Steve Jobs anymore? And when Tim Cook is gone, what, what, what are people going to think? No one thinks about that, you know. And so somebody builds a big building and their name is up there in lights and they die and leave it to their son and the first thing the son does is take dad's name down and put his name up, right? And so the psalmist is just trying to say, listen, wealth is fleeting. And then the third, and you need to look up at the, at the screen at this slide before I tell you the, the, t the title here. Don't notice, that, I'm sorry the edges got cut off, but you have two pastors talking to each other. I always told my people, you can't take it with you. But Harry must not have been listening. You got a U-Haul hooked up to a hearse, right? And that's exactly what we find in verse 14. Like sheep, they are all laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall, he shall receive me. Selah. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself, for men will praise you when you do well for yourself. Then verse 19, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. In other words, he shall, shall die. And notice this, they shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. And so there's two things that the psalmist is saying here. Not only can you not take it with you, but he's describing people who, because they trust in wealth rather than trusting in God, I want to show you what he says. The end of verse 19, they shall never see light. I heard a story today you guys know who Voltaire is, right? Voltaire said, as he looked at the Bible, he says, in a hundred years, this book will have become so irrelevant that nobody will read it or desire to own it. Less than a hundred years after that, Voltaire's home was used as a distribution center for the Geneva Bible. <laughs> Isn't that just God getting him back? But the nurse who was at his side when he died, as Voltaire was slipping into eternity, just before he slipped into eternity, he was still cursing God and cursing the name of Jesus. And as he began to lose consciousness and slip into eternity, the nurse that was there said he cried out three times, a little more light, a little more light, a little more light. And then she said, after watching Voltaire, as a non-believer, die and slip into eternity, she says, I will never again sit with unsaved people when they die. 
I cannot watch people slip into eternity without knowing the Lord. And he trusted in all sorts of things, but he didn't trust in the Lord. And I hate to say it, but people in that situation, they shall never see the light of the Lord for all of eternity. Pretty scary. And so Job in chapter 1, verse 21, you can look up at the screen. Job summed it all up. And I sure hope that every one of us in this room right now can take the perspective when it comes to wealth and riches and possessions that Job had. Job said this, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Denzel Washington, I, I found a little caption of Denzel today on the internet, and he said, first of all, he said, A hearse will never tow a U-Haul. He said, I've been blessed to make hundreds of millions of dollars. And he said, you may have nothing. He said, it has nothing to do with what you have, but what you do with what you have. And so I want to challenge you tonight, whether you have two nickels to rub together or, or whether God has really blessed you and you're prosperous, hold it out to the Lord with an open hand. Let him put in and take out as he sees fit, as he sees fit but never, ever, ever trust in your riches because they will let you down. We go now into, oh, I forgot to uh, read verse 5. I wanted to share something. Um, back in verse 5, you remember that the psalmist made a statement. He said there's no reason for anybody to fear. Verse 15 tells us why he had such confidence. Look at verse 15 one last time with me. He says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. And so he sums it up. The, the fool trusts in riches, but a person of faith trusts in the Lord and has all the confidence in the world because the Lord's promises are always fulfilled. And so that brings us to Psalm chapter 50. And notice we're going to call this the sure judgment of God. So we talked in Psalm 49 about how foolish it is to trust in riches. Now in Psalm 50, a different author speaks to us about the fact that, that the judgment of God in the future, and it's our future also, is very, very sure. Notice the introduction. This is a Psalm of Asaph. This is the first of 13 Psalms that this man Asaph wrote. Uh, in, in 1 Chronicles 6, we learned that Asaph was one of David's choir leaders. He wrote Psalm 50 and also 73 through 83. And then in 2 Chronicles 29, we learned two things about him. Number one, he was a skilled musician. But the second thing, he was a seer, a, a prophet. And it's really neat when you got a, a musical guy who also has the gift of prophecy. Tonight, we're going to see Asaph writing a prophecy that the Lord gives him, and it's turned into a song. And you'll see in the first few verses that Asaph speaks. He kind of gives us a summary, but then God begins to speak through him, and the gift of prophecy begins to come out through Asaph, and God will speak in the first person to the inhabitants of the earth. So look, beginning um, in verse 1. And again, Asaph is kind of summarizing. He says, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of its sun to its going down. Just real quick before we get in, I want to share what Asaph is doing here. He uses three titles of God in the beginning. In, in English, it's not clear at all. But he uses the word El, Elohim, and then Jehovah. He uses the very specific names of God. God, the mighty God, the Trinity God, and then Jehovah. It's He who has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. From the one side of the earth to the other side of the earth, Asaph is saying, God wants your full attention. He, he wants to speak to you. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me. 
those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. And so Selah means we need to think about this. We need to ponder it. We need to understand it. In a nutshell, here in these first six verses, Asaph is telling us that there is a day coming when God's patience, and he says here he will not keep silent. What that means is that God has been patient with sin, but he is no longer going to be patient. He's going to then deal with sin. Asaph says there's a day coming when God's patience with mankind is going to run out. And he is going to judge mankind for some specific things. For their rebellion against him and for their rebellion against his word. And we have more insight, you and I, than, than Asaph did. We're going to talk for a minute when we get a little bit further in here about the insight that you and I have that Asaph didn't have. Um, in fact, let's go ahead and do that. L look back, if you would, at verse 3. He says, kind of speaking of how this judgment is going to take place, and in verse 2 he spoke about how judgment is going to shine forth from Zion. That's the city of God, Jerusalem. Verse 3 he talks about, he says, Our God shall come. Listen, I want to develop that for a minute. I think this is so, so important, and I love the fact that this lines up with what we're studying on Sundays in Revelation. It begins with the rapture of the church. Our God shall come. You and I are not objects of wrath. 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, it says that we were not appointed unto wrath, but to receive salvation. And so, before the wrath of God comes upon the unbelieving world, Jesus is going to come to the earth in the sky. He won't touch down. It's called the rapture of the church. Jesus comes in the air. The bride of Christ, the church, is immediately evacuated from the, the earth. We're taken to heaven for seven years. And then judgment comes upon the earth in the form of the great tribulation period. At the end, then the Lord comes again. Our God shall come. Verse 3, Jesus comes back. The second coming. He defeats the armies of the world and the Antichrist. He casts Satan into the lake of fire. Or Satan gets cast into the bottomless pit. The Antichrist and the false prophet get cast into the lake of fire. And then the thousand-year reign occurs. And at the end of that thousand-year reign, we have what's called the second resurrection. And all of the non-believing dead... People who went into eternity not saved are, are resurrected and they stand at what's called the great white throne judgment. And they're judged by their works and they're judged by the fact that their name was not written in the Lamb's book of life and they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. And at this point, God's judgment of the wicked is completely fulfilled. We'll see this over the next few weeks on Sunday mornings. So Asaph gives this overview of judgment. And I got to tell you that when I study this today and as I teach it to you right now, it is sobering. Because we've been reading about this for, for years. I, I have. I'm sure you have. For years we've been reading about the judgment of God coming upon the earth. And it's like, that's great. Where do you want to have lunch? And rather, it's supposed to stir us to action to holiness in our own lives, but, but to tell the world that this is coming. And I know you're thinking exactly what I'm thinking. They'll think we're kooks. That's okay. Some of them thinking we're kooks will listen to what we have to say and they'll turn and they'll go and be saved. But beginning in verse 7, God is speaking to a group of people that you and I would call lukewarm believers. He's speaking to the ancient Israelites, but let's just equate this with the lukewarm church, okay? He's telling them that they're not immune from judgment. He's saying to the lukewarm church, so to speak, judgment is coming, and it's coming upon you. Notice verse 7, Hear my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. This is God speaking now. And what's interesting is as you read this, the people of God, the people who claimed to be in a covenant relationship with God, didn't even have a clue that their life was offending God. And so he's going to educate them. Look, he says, I am God, your God. Verse 8, I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. 
I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine, and all its fullness. Verse 13, I will eat the flesh of bulls, or excuse me, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Now let's set the context. Look at verse uh, uh, 8. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings which are continually before me. All the way back in the book of Exodus, God gave Israel a sacrificial system by which their sins could be forgiven and by which they could offer God thanksgiving and praise and by which they could also enjoy fellowship with God. The sacrificial system was designed to bring them a covering for sin, an opportunity to worship God, to have fellowship with God, right? And they were doing it. Verse 8 makes it really clear. He says, these things are continually before me. The Israelites were going through all the religious motions. I I'm going to bring this to you and I. They were in church every time the doors were open. They sang the songs. They wrote a check and dropped it in the offering. They served at VBS. They did all sorts of stuff. But the issue is that Israel's worship had become nothing more than empty rituals. Going to church tomorrow? Yeah, I guess. I mean, unless there's a good game on. Well, we could go fishing. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll feel guilty. Let's go to church, and then during the last song, we'll slip out, we'll go fishing. And during worship, we'll think about fishing. And while the pastor's preaching, we'll dream about fishing. You know, and I'm not going to give anything this week because we'll use that money for gas in the boat because we're going fishing. You know, it's just something like that. The Israelites had just become lukewarm in their worship. They had just completely disconnected from God himself, but they were still going through the motions. In fact, flip over to Isaiah chapter 29. This is the last time I'll ask you to leave the Psalms tonight. But I want you to see this in your Bible. You may want to underline this. You may want to go back and read this later. But Isaiah was addressing this same situation in chapter 29, verse 13. We're all probably very familiar with this text. Isaiah writing, speaking for the Lord the same way Asaph was. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, so they sang the songs, and they honor me with their lips, they spoke the word, but they have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandments of men. So they had gotten religious, and they had gotten very into the rituals of worship, but their heart was far from God. The Word of God had been replaced by the commandments of men. And I think that we need to take a moment of self-examination here. I'm going to just ask a couple of questions. I wonder if Isaiah might be describing your personal devotional life. My personal church attendance habits. Your relationship with God's Word. Your relationship with the 30 minutes that occur in a church service before the Word is taught. We call it praise and worship. Could it be that you're drawing near the Lord with your mouth? You're honoring God with your lips, but your heart is far from Him? That you're more into tradition than you are the teaching of the Word of God? If that's the case, some serious changes need to take place, and those are given to us back in Psalm chapter 50, verse 14 and on. Notice here three things that God desires of us. Verse 14 Asaph says, offer to God thanksgiving. I would call this worship. We're never to lose a heart of thanksgiving towards God. Keep your worship life fresh. That, that word thanksgiving is a really important part of our life. You should give God thanks multiple times a day. The minute you wake up, thank you, Lord, for the breath in my lungs. Thank you for my spouse. Thank you for my kids. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, that you're sanctifying me. 
Thank you, Lord, that one day I'm going to see you face to face. Lord, thank you that there's gas in the car to get to work today. Lord, thank you for the food. Don't ever eat without praying. And don't do that in front of your kids, especially little ones. Let them always see you giving thanks. I love praying with my grandkids. You know, they don't always think about it, man. They're just stuffing food in their face. Hey, guys, let's just stop real quick and give God thanks. What God is saying is that I, I want you to have a real worship relationship with me, not just empty rituals. And then second, the Bible is so clear regarding the believer's giving relationship with God and, and service relationship with God. Um, giving back to God is an act of worship and serving God is an act of worship. I think we need to take time to learn what the Bible says about giving and serving. Notice this. And pay your vows to the Most High. So operate in thanksgiving, but, but also fulfill your, your obligations to the Lord. I am amazed every time I teach on, on, on giving... Um, and you know that here at Calvary, we speak about money very rarely. The only time we talk about it is when it's in the text in front of us as we're going through. But when we are talking about money, I like to, to teach it clearly. And whenever I teach on the subject of tithing or Christian giving or anything, I always get on the internet to see what's being said. You know, it's, it's interesting how many people who Jesus died for on a cross by giving himself will then write books about how Christians have you know, really no need to give anything back to the Lord. And I just kind of wonder, wow, is that the way you respond to what the Lord did for you? You know what? That's my 50000 a year I make. God can go get a job and make his own 50000 a year if he wants to make that, you know? You know, you cannot outgive God. And the scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is a wonderful thing. Serving is a wonderful thing. It's my personal opinion that churches should never have to make any kind of announcement that there's a need for teachers or a need for guys in the parking lot or a need for this. I, we should have waiting lists as far as I'm concerned. The hardest part should be the church leaders praying and choosing who the next person that gets to serve is. So the other people on the list aren't going to be offended. You know. I think it would be great if I stood up here on a Sunday morning and I just got to say this, this has been a very generous church since day one. So don't anybody take this as if like the church is going under or something. But wouldn't it be cool if one Sunday morning the Lord just caused one of our leaders to stand up and say, folks, just don't give anymore. We don't know what to do with all this money. We'll tell you when it's time to give again. Yeah, but but I, I just think that we have a really hard time responding to the Lord with thanksgiving and fulfilling some of the vows that the Lord might have us make. Look at verse 15. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So the third one is that communication with God glorifies him. He loves when we pray. Um, and I'm just, I talk about my grandkids a lot and my kids. I love it when my daughters or my sons-in-law will call me up and say, hey, you got a minute. I got a situation. I want to get your opinion. And I'll say, sure. I just love it. I mean, I'm grinning from ear to ear when one of my daughters calls me or one of my sons-in-law. And I love it when one of the kids comes up with me and says, Papa, can you fix this? I'm needed. I'm important. At least now. I'll get old and I'll get forgotten about, according to the last psalm at least. But, but look at this. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You realize that when we're having a tough time, God's up there going, they're going to call. I know they're going to call. They're going to pray. They're going to ask me for help. And you know what? I'm going to help them. Want to know why? I love them. And maybe one of the angels goes, but did you see what he did? <laughs> yep. And the blood of my son covered that. I'm still going to help them. I love them. I love them. So, so when Isaiah says, you know, they're, they're, they are honoring me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The psalmist comes back and says, this is how you draw near to the Lord with your heart. Offer God thanksgiving. Pay your vows. And then call upon Him when you need Him. And so verse 16, excuse me, God, began to speak, uh, God begins to speak to the wicked and unbelieving that are headed for judgment. And you're going to be a little bit surprised at what He says to them. Notice verse 16, to the wicked God says, what right have you to declare my statutes? Or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. Now, I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing because this group in verse 16, God addressed them as the wicked. I hope you see that. But then as we saw, 
they're not outsiders. These are people who claim to be in a covenant relationship with God. For you and I, we would say these are people who claim to be saved. They claim to be part of the church. But notice what they do. They hate instruction and they cast God's word behind them. They claim to be believers, but they walk according to their own wisdom and they reject God and all his ways and, and their life has a very specific look to it. Notice the verse 18. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and you have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother, family members, close relatives, you know, husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, dads, whatever, and you slander your own mother's son. And the Lord says, you claim to be my people, but when you act this way, I address you as the wicked, and I have something to say to you. Notice verse 21. He says, these things you have done, and I kept silent. I've been patient. I've been waiting for you to repent. You thought that I was altogether like you. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. So this kind of person claims to be a believer, but if you were to look at Galatians 5, you would see that their life reflects more of the works of the flesh than the fruit of the Spirit. And they do something interesting. You thought that I was altogether like you. There's a lot of people that create a God in their own image. They decide what God is like. And so when you talk to them about something, they go, well, the God that I know would never judge somebody for, and then they start talking about things that we know God has already said he's going to judge people for, for adultery, adultery, or, you know, thievery, or this, that, and the other. And, and God says, here's the issue, is that you think I'm like you, but I'm nothing like you. I'm completely different. And so he says, these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought I was like you, but now you need to consider this, those of you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. He's basically saying, it's time to repent. And he's speaking to ancient Israel, the people who claim to have a covenant relationship with him, but, but ancient Israel is no more. You and I are studying this. This applies to the church. And it's as if the Lord is saying, just because you attend church and you claim to be a believer doesn't mean that you're in a covenant relationship with me. Jesus said you would know them by their fruit. And so God uh, says here in verse 23, whoever offers praise glorifies me and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. And, and I really like that. What he's saying is, okay, there's an acid test for those who claim to be part of my covenant family. He says first, those who offer praises, they glorify me, they're part of my family. To him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. But he says to everybody else, the wicked, judgment is coming and it's going to be scary. I have a personal opinion, and again, just, just hear me and consider this. I think that as we look at this and compare it to other New Testament texts, I think we see a picture of the rapture of the church where you have church people left behind, not believers, but those who were playing games with God, people who filled churches because they liked spiritual things, but they never really entered into a covenant relationship with God. They never really surrendered. And I think it's going to be scary when Jesus comes and raptures his church away because there's going to be a lot of people who were attending the church but were not really part of the church. They weren't the bride of Christ. And all of a sudden, they're going to look around and go, where'd everybody go? And they're going to read through the book of Revelation again. They're going to read through, you know, like Psalm 50. And they're going to go, I was one of those wicked. I claimed to know God, but I lived a very wicked lifestyle, masking who I really was. And now... I've been left here to face the tribulation. And what a scary thing, but I bet a lot of those people will get saved. Now, we're going to do something that I cannot believe we're going to do. Psalm 51 is one of the most powerful psalms, but we've already studied 32, which is the other side of this psalm. And so we are actually just going to buzz through this. Psalm 51, we're going to call this the overwhelming mercy of God. And this is the fourth 
penitential, penitential, excuse me, psalm. Psalms of repentance. This is the fourth that we've looked at. It's written to the chief musician, so it was supposed to be put to music and sung in public worship services. It's designed to teach. And it's a psalm of David. And then notice we, we're given the context. When Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, I think we all know the story. It was the spring. Kings are supposed to be out on the battlefield with their men. But David, for whatever reason, decided that he was going to take a season of just hanging out at home and taking it easy. He was being lazy. And one evening, he gets up from a nap. He's walking on his roof, and he sees this beautiful woman named Bathsheba bathing on her roof. He lusted after her. He called to her. She was brought to him. They had an adulterous relationship. She was the wife of one of David's mighty men named Uriah. And then he just sends her away. He kind of had his way with her and sends her away. Later she comes and she reveals that she conceived a baby. She's pregnant. And so David decides, I'm going to have to cover this up. Think about Psalm 32. That was all about uncovering our sin. So David decides, I've got to cover this up. So he calls Uriah back from the heat of the battle. And he spends an evening with him and he says, well, why don't you go home to your wife and, you know, and enjoy your beautiful wife for the evening. You know what he's saying is, I hope that you guys are intimate and you'll think that this baby is yours. We'll cover this all up. Well, Uriah, two nights in a row, he had too much integrity. He slept in different places, but not in his own home with his wife. And he said, how can I do this when my men are at war? So what David does is he comes up with this plan to have Uriah killed in battle. And he writes it out, gives this sealed letter to Uriah. Uriah carries it back to the general. The general follows the king's orders. And in the heat of the battle, he pulls back, leaves Uriah on the front lines unprotected, and Uriah dies in battle. And David, now is this great opportunity for the king to appear to be such a great guy. He's going to marry the widow of his fallen soldier and raise up a child with Uriah's name, right? Well, we know that the baby was born, it was sick, and the baby died. And the prophet Nathan comes and confronts him, and, and as Nathan confronts him, David decides he's going to repent. And this is a psalm about true repentance. There's fake repentance, but this is true repentance. Notice David begins... He goes before the Lord. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Notice David calls his action transgression. I broke God's law. He says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. That, that word means David knew he was guilty. And then he says, Cleanse me from my sin. <clears throat> Notice he didn't say, Cleanse me from my character flaws. Cleanse me from my indiscretions, right? Have you ever been with somebody who's telling you that they've, they've sinned and you begin to pray with them and they're like, well, God, you know, I kind of messed up. God, I got a little sideways. You know, true repentance uses words like transgression, iniquity, and sin. And then notice verse 3, he owns it. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions. I did this thing, Lord. And then he says, my sin is always before me. And if you know Psalm 32, for about a year of his life, the sin had just eaten him up. He, he decided to, to cover it rather than confess it. And it was making him physically ill. He was having mental problems. He couldn't sleep at night. Sin was making him crazy. And so look at verse 4. He says, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so... Even though David had sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah and, and David's other wives, plural, and the nation that he was king over, he recognizes that first and foremost, his sin was against God because he had broken and ignored God's commandments. And, and then he goes on and he acknowledges, notice that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's basically saying, God, whatever consequences you decide to pour out upon me for what I've done, I am willing to take them and you are completely just in judging me. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and, and in sin my mother conceived me. So David now tells us the reason for his sinful actions. He, he says the reason that I committed sinful actions is because 
I was born under the curse of original sin and I have a sin nature. And although David was, was in a covenant relationship with the Lord, his sin was covered. He was at this time in his life allowing sin to reign over his mortal body instead of walking in the spirit or, or walking in freedom. And because of Jesus, you and I are given a new nature at salvation. We don't have to sin. How often will a believer say, well, you know, I just, I can't help myself. Well, you can because you are a new creation in Christ. You have been set free from the bondage of sin and death. All of us have. Do we still sin? Yes. We're born again people, saved people who occasionally choose to sin. Sometimes we choose to walk in a lifestyle of sin. But that's not because God hasn't provided freedom. That's because we've chosen to continue in that way. And, and David is basically saying, I didn't have to do this, but I did. I, I followed my sin nature instead of walking in the Spirit. And so verse 6 he says this, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Picture David saying, you know, in the past, Lord, up, up to this point in my life, I've been more concerned with outer appearances than with inner transformation. Here's a question. Have you ever been in that place where you were just putting on a show for everybody else? When worship was going on, your, your hands are up, but deep down inside, you know, I'm not connecting with God. You know, I'm just putting on a show because I want people to think I'm spiritual. Hey, I'm the king of the nation. I, I got to act holy. And, and David is saying, Lord, you want me to experience truth in the inward parts. You want me to deal with you with truth in the inward parts. But all I've been doing is just putting on an outward show. And that's why I got myself in this position. But notice he says, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Anybody in the room ever learned wisdom through a really bad mistake? through a very sinful season of your life, and afterwards you go, man, have I learned some lessons? That's what David is just saying, right? Verse 7, David is now calling to the Lord. He's saying, I have confessed my sin, and Lord, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things for me. And before I read this, I want to say something real quick, blanket statement. If you're here tonight, or you're listening on the internet, you're listening on a CD or on YouTube or something like that, and the Lord is speaking to you right now because you are currently David, you're playing church, you're playing religious, you're playing spiritual, but you're involved in an emotional affair, an, an adulterous relationship, you're stealing from your boss, you're drinking too much, whatever it is, you, you got something and you know it's sin. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, the first section, David confessed it. And David asks now a couple of things. And God is going to do these things for David, and I want everybody to know that if you ask, God will do these things for you. Notice the first thing. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Sin makes us dirty. Sin makes us feel very dirty. And David experienced that and he says to the Lord, Father, would you please now cleanse me from my sin? I need to be white again. And then second thing, David is going to ask for joy. Sin robs you of your joy. And David, the second thing, he says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities, and create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So first he says, please cleanse me. Now he says, restore my joy. Then he says, restore in me a clean heart and he says renew a steadfast spirit in me give me the ability to persevere and then look at this do not cast me away from your presence and don't take your holy spirit away from me david is saying i'm in a broken relationship with you lord but i i want to have fellowship with you again and then verse 12 restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit these five or six things that david asked for god gave him and I want to say tonight, if you're caught up in some sin and you're having a hard time dealing with it, go to somebody tonight. Confess it. And, and then ask the Lord to do these things for you. Lord, wash me. Make me joyful again. Create in me a clean 
heart. Give me new fellowship with you again. All of these different things. And I promise you, because of who God is, he will do those things for you. But then look at what David says. God, if you'll do that for me, then I'm going to do something for you. Please look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. You know that David did that? Psalm chapter 32 is the fulfillment of 5113. Psalm chapter 32 is David teaching sinners how to quit hiding their sin, how to quit hiding their transgression, and get back into a right relationship with the Lord and be converted. And, and David did that. So he says, God, not only restore me, use me again. I know the worst thing in the world is when you fall into sin and it becomes kind of a pattern, you think you've lost your ministry forever, and, and God is so good. He's not going to do that. Verse 14 God wants to use restored people. He says, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Two things here. David committed at least two capital crimes. He committed adultery and he committed murder. You could maybe add unto that conspiracy. David should have been put to death twice under the law of Moses. But even when Nathan confronted him, Nathan said, the Lord is not going to require your life. And here's the thing. One of the reasons we don't confess sin is we are scared of the immediate consequences. Well, if I tell her, she'll leave me. Well, if I tell him, he's going to be mad at me. And you know what? Our sin always brings consequences. David's sin brought consequences for the rest of his life. However, the consequences that he feared the most never came upon him because God's grace is so good. Maybe tonight you're involved with something and you're scared to confess it because of the consequences. I have a feeling from what the scriptures say that confessing it removes the high level of consequences and brings us back to a place where God begins to deal with us with grace and mercy. But when we hide our sin for an extended period of time, then people no longer trust us, and the consequence level gets higher and higher. Uh, another thing, verse 15. Um, oh, let me just say this. Genuine repentance in David's life resulted in he being cleansed by God, restored by God, and used by God. And then in verse 15 on, he says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. And this is the greatest thing. Look, I, I need you guys to respond. How many of you have ever gotten involved in, in some pretty serious sin and you experience the Lord's forgiveness and restoration? Maybe you thought you were going to lose a marriage or a ministry or a job and God didn't do those things and He restored you and you're in a way better place now than you ever were before the sin came into your life. Not that sin helps. It's just that the sin taught you a lesson and now you're, you're walking closer with the Lord forever. You know what David said here? He said, that happened in my life and I spent the rest of my life telling people about it. So brag on the Lord in a sanctified way. Tell people, you don't have to give the gory details, but man, you wouldn't believe the pit I was in and then the Lord lifted me out. He says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else, else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And these, O oh God, you will not despise. So God didn't want another animal sacrifice. He didn't want David to, you know, write a big check or something like that. He wanted David's spirit to be broken so that it could be repaired. He wanted David's heart to become contrite so that God could then put it all back together. And then verse 18, David now says, God, you've, you've helped me, but I need you to help our people. He says, do good in your pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, and then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. With burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. And this is just simply David pleading with the Lord for Jerusalem itself to return to moral integrity and to begin experiencing military prosperity. In other words, David thought, my sin is going to take out the whole city and some army is going to come and wipe us out. And David comes to realize that's crazy. God is going to forgive me and God is going to bless Jerusalem 
But he prays, Lord, have the people turn back to you and, and Lord, just give us military victory and, and the whole thing. I can sum up this whole psalm in one sentence and that is that repentance leads to blessing. Repentance does not lead to being cursed. And I just really feel strongly that the Lord is speaking to some people tonight about some specific things and he really wants you to trust him that you can confess it to him, that you can put it all on the table, not 80% of it, not 90% of it. You can put it all on the table with God and with other people. You can come clean and you can be completely restored because that's what happened with David. So Father, tonight in Psalm 49, we were taught not to trust in anything but you, not in riches, not in people, not in success, that you are the only one who can deliver us. It was the blood of Jesus that redeemed us. And then in Psalm 50, we learned, God, that you are patient, but that your patience is going to run out. And world judgment is coming, and we as the church don't want to find ourselves on the wrong side of that. And so, Lord, for anybody playing church but dabbling with things you spoke tonight that we are never to claim to be yours and then continually walk in open rebellion. There, there's no security in that. And then, Father, in Psalm 51, you taught us from David's experience that genuine personal repentance results in genuine personal revival. And, Lord, there may be people in this room tonight who need a revival, and it's going to require repentance. And we pray that you would just do the work that only you can do, Father, and that is the convicting of our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But then also, Lord, give each person who needs it confidence that they can confess sin to you and that you are not going to beat them up with their sin, but you are going to be compassionate. Loving kindness and mercy are going to come forth. Other human beings are going to offer forgiveness. And, and yes, there will be consequences. There will be a road to walk before full restoration takes place. But on the other side of that is a walk with you and relationship with other people that cannot ever take place with this sin still going on. So speak to individuals tonight and give clear direction, Lord. Thank you for these three psalms. Thank you, Lord, for the way you speak to us so clearly from your word. And as we worship you for these last few minutes, Lord, let our hearts overflow with joy. Let our hearts be near you tonight, Father. And we just pray over the remainder of this week, Lord, glorify yourself in everything that we do. And all God's people said, Amen.